The example I used, remember, remember was the caravan that went into the Christian city, first passing through the besieging armies of the Arabs. And the besieging army of the Arabs opened up to let the caravan go into the Christian city, offload its cargo, loaded onto Christian ships. The Christian ships set sail through a blockading Saracen fleet. The Saracen fleet parted to let the Christian ships go through with their cargo of spices to be sold in the Roman market. Now, who has this tremendous power to make truces between warring factions in the middle of wars so that trade might continue? Now, that's the very interesting question. Then from there, we went on to India. And we stated that India produces three major things because it seems that most of the caravans originate in India. We said that India produces jewels, spices, and gold. Now, after you've done, after you've satisfied your local need, the only thing jewels, spices, and gold is good for is export. You've got to export them or they lose their value. Since the focus of our attention is now on India, there are certain things we have to learn about India. Frankly, there are three things we have to learn about India. The first is their religion. You'll never understand all the uh, Hindu religions because the Hindus collect religions like some people collect uh, little dogs. They have literally thousands of different religions, but basically they are all grouped under one God called uh, uh, the great, uh, the, their overall God uh, uh, of the of the uh, Hindus and Ram. I couldn't think of the name Ram to save my life. Thank you. You sir. taught me well enough. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then Brahma created two his sons, uh, Vishnu and Siva. Vishnu, the god of everyday affairs, and Siva, the god of sex, birth, and death. The second thing is feudalism, and the third thing is Dharma. Feudalism is how they rule in India. It is the Indian technique of rule. They have four classes. You have the priest, you have the kings and the warriors. Then you have the shopkeepers and the farmers. And then you have the workers, the four classes. First, the Indian religion, Hinduism, then feudalism, and then we come to the most important part that we are interested in, and that's Dharma. The Hindus collect religions like women collect jewels for a necklace. They will collect uh, Islam and add Dharma to it, and then it becomes uh, Islamic Hinduism. All that is necessary is to add Dharma. Dharma is ecumenicalism. Dharma is composed of three parts. The first part is N, N-O-T. N, nonviolence in word or deed. O, obedience to the laws, to your rulers placed over you, obedience to the gods, and obedience to the king. T, tolerance for all races, creeds, and colors, and religions. Uh, that is the essence of Dharma. And you can attach Dharma to any religion and turn any religion into Hinduism. It might have all the bells and whistles of the old religion, but once you add Dharma to it, or ecumenicalism to it, then it becomes Hinduism. It excludes no one. It includes everyone. In a situation like that, the merchant can do business. He can do business where he is always accepted. He cannot do business if he is not accepted. Next, Buddhism. Buddhism is nothing more than reform Hinduism. Don't get hung up on names. 
Buddhism is Reformed Hinduism. The father of Buddhism is Asaka. Asaka is known by more people than Jesus Christ is. Asaka, the father of Buddhism, is the one who made Asaka's bequest. He gave all of India, all of the world, all of the riches of the world to the priesthood. He also endowed the priesthood with 1,000 million pieces of gold, making the priesthood of India the richest priesthood to ever exist on the face of the earth. He established, in addition to Dharma, he is the one who codified Dharma. In addition to that, he established Dharma Matras, the enforcers, the ones who reward those who practice Dharma and punish those who do not. It was the Indian Civil Rights Organization, the Dharma Matras. Later on, the Catholic Church had the Inquisition. Today we have the Civil Rights Division. It's all the same thing, with different names. Dharma spread to the Greeks when the Greeks invaded India. They took back Dharma with them. And Asapa bragged and wrote in stone that he had conquered the Greek world with Dharma. Without shedding a drop of blood, he had conquered the Greek world. So therefore, we must assume that the ancient Greeks and the ancient <coughs> Romans had been dramatized, that they were wide open to trade with all the world. The problem started when, the big problem started when the Greeks tried to enforce Dhamma on the Israelites. The Israelites revolted against that. That's why your book, uh, the Maccabees, the book of the Maccabees, I strongly recommend that you read the book of Maccabees. And it tells you the sufferings of the people and the great, uh, the revolt that went on and on and on until they finally won out over a powerful, mighty uh, 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 Greek empire. Born in that conflict were two religious sects. The first is the sect of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the hard-shelled Baptists of that day and time. They were straight as ours. <coughs> the Sadducees were also born in that conflict. They were the white trash. They were the ones who wanted to deal and do business with the Greeks. To give, to give lip service to God, but obey the king. A Sadducee was a hard man to spot, but he was willing always to do business with the enemy. The Pharisee and the Sadducee. Next came a king, Hyacanus. Hyacanus was king of the Israelites, of the land that had, that had uh, vanquished the uh, Greeks. He arrived with a great reputation and with a considerable military expertise. He was a good general. He looked to the south and he saw the spice rooms. Now look carefully. I drew a map for you this time so you can see for yourself. Here is India, the big continent of India. This is the western world. Here's the little Mediterranean Sea, the corner up here. And this is China over here. Midway between is India. All the silks and all the spices and all the jewels from China pass by sea to India, and from India, they cross on across the Indian Sea, and they either go up into Babylon, or the Persian Gulf, or they come up the Red Sea. They go up the Red Sea, and you'll notice this little small, tiny, little bay. It's called the Gulf of Aqaba. That is where they offloaded. And they transported the goods across this little piece of land from the Gulf of Aqaba over to the Mediterranean Sea, where they loaded on, sh on ships that took the goods to Greece and Rome. This little piece of land between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea is a very valuable piece of land. That is where the spice routes go. 
and who was going to run the spice routes and protect them? Well, they had a group of people down there called Idolians. They were the cursed people of God. God had cursed them. They were also very rich because they got the money, their share of the spice routes. Now, you see why it was so valuable? That's why King Solomon, when he said he got a share of the spice routes, or the spice trade, that's what he was talking about. He got a cut of the operation. Along came Hyacontus many, many years later, and he said, hey, I'm big and strong, I got a strong army, I'm going down there and whip up on them, and I'm going to take my share. So he takes his army down there, and he whips up on Adam in. But if he killed all the Adam ends, who is going to run the spice race? Who's going to operate? Well, he couldn't very well kill them. So he did something that had never been done before in the history of Israel. He transformed Edomites into Jews. No bastard shall enter the congregation of Israel forever. Made no difference. That was the law. So how do you get around the law? Well, the law was taught by the Pharisees. He switched. He became a Sadducee. A Sadducee, they believe all the laws and whatever the king or high priest says. So the high priest, he was the high priest. He said that it was all right. So it was all right. They incorporated the Adamans who worked the trade route into Judea. Now you got two kinds of Jews. You've got Israelite Jews and you got Adamian Jews. The thing that could never be was no bastard shall enter the congregation of Israel forever, and there they were in the middle of Israel. And to make matters worse, Rome came along, and Rome took over Palestine. And Rome uh, confirmed Herod as king. And Herod was an Idumean. So not only did you have Idumeans in Jewry, there were Idumean Jews and Israelite Jews. Now you got a ruler who's a stranger. Thou shalt have no stranger to rule over thee. The law was being violated left and right. And not only that, as head of the uh, as head of the state, he was most influential in anything that went on in the religion. And the religion of the people became corrupt, so corrupt it was indescribable. It was so corrupt that the Pharisees had been corrupted. Everyone was corrupted, and into that mess. Our Lord and Master, the Word, sent His Son, the Word made flesh. And the Word made flesh went into that and taught the Word all over again. And the people lapped it up. The Word spread all over the land. All of a sudden, people wouldn't do business with Idumeans. They wouldn't do business with Romans. They wouldn't do business with strangers. It spread out beyond the boundaries of, of, of uh, Judea and Palestine. It spread over into what is now Turkey in a flash. It spread, jumped the ocean, and spread into uh, uh, Italy itself. Wherever Israel had been scattered in 721 B.C., in those 700 years, where had Israel been scattered to that had been taken into captivity? They had been scattered all over the world. They were in Europe, they were in Spain, they were in Italy, they were in North Africa, they were in Greece, they were all over. And wherever they were, the word made flesh, the word spread. And it was creating havoc in the Roman Empire. All of a sudden, people found out who they were, they preached the religion of, uh, of their fathers, they taught the law, statutes, and judgments, and the trade of the Roman Empire was getting ready to come to a screeching halt. It was at this time that the Christian Israelites left the synagogue. The Edomite Jews continued on in the synagogue. That's where the parting of the ways occurred. 
the Romans had to do something to neutralize this Christian wave that was sweeping Rome. And what they did is they backed, the state backed, a new teacher that had come to the fore called Martian. Martian taught what he called Christianity. But his form of Christianity was different from anything that had gone before. His Christianity was the teachings and writings of Paul and the first two chapters of Luke. That consisted of his uh, canon. He was the first one to ever compose a canon. When you compose a canon, it means that this is it and everything else isn't. So this meant that everything that wasn't in his canon was left there. He said that Jesus Christ was God. Paul sat on his right hand and uh, <clears throat> Martian sat on his left hand. Martianism said there was no laws, statutes, and judgments. And a man could go, go and do anything he wanted to do. Martianism at one time had far more churches, had far more congregation, and far more adherents than, uh, than Orthodox Christianity had. That continued until uh, we have an emperor coming along called Constantine. About uh, this time, something had happened to neutralize Martianism. The Christians accepted Paul but they accepted Paul to prove the law. The Martians accepted Paul to disprove the law. It was a basic uh, a difference right there. Christianity, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, was the law. Martianism was all the parables, teachings of Jesus without the law. In other words, the nullification of everything that might interrupt trade, or might interrupt dawn, or might interrupt this ecumenical one worldism of that day and time. When they accepted Paul and placed Paul between the, uh, between the uh, teachings of Jesus, the Gospels, and the teachings of Peter and uh, so forth at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the Bible, uh, they had, had him very safely tucked in there so that you have, to, you have to interpret Paul according to the word. You can't interpret Paul in such a way so as it nullifies the law because that means there is a misinterpretation someplace. Paul, the Christians, must be interpreted according to the law. Martianism was losing ground left and right until an emperor came along named Constantine. And if you came with him, join him. As emperor, he institutionalized Christianity. But he did it his way. He took in the Hindu concept, the Hindu rituals. He took them all in. He took in the, this, the, the processions. He took in the robes, the skull caps, the pointed caps they use on occasion, same as it did in India. Incense, took that in, use of candles, use of chants, female priests, male priests. Uh, he took in uh, 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 the, uh, the use of relics and uh, pilgrimages to holy spots. He took them all in, and that became part of this thing called Catholicism. Catholicism was the law of the land. And no sooner than that happened than all sorts of isms started breaking out. And that's where it gets interesting. Remember, there is one religion for a Christian, and that's the Word. And Jesus Christ was the Word made flesh. In order for the trader to do business, he must nullify that. In order for the Hindu to sell his spices and his jewels and his gold, he must first nullify the word. The way he nullifies the word is he takes the local religion that is going and combines it with Dharma. Dharma. 
No, you may not raise your hand against any religion in word or hand and word or deed. You must be obedient to the king and the laws of the land and your gods and uh, you must be tolerant of all races and religions. With, if a person believes that, you can do business with him. It makes no difference whether he is Mohammedan or Buddhist or Christian or whatever he is. If he is a believer in Donald, you can do business with him. It is a businessman's religion and it must be taught before business can be can take place. As soon as the Catholic Church was really established, you had imitators. And the name Martian slips from history. A new name appears in the history books. Check your encyclopedias, they all say the same. It is called Polycanism. Polycanism. It is the use of Paul to disprove the law. It is Christianity without the law. That is Paulcanism. And it's one of many names. Paulcanism was so strong in the uh, days uh, after the founding of the Catholic Church that they were strong enough to incorporate whole kingdoms against Rome. So you had the so-called Catholic Christian Rome against Paulican Christian Syria and these other lands. And it spread all over. Paulicanism. Now I'm coming back to that. At the same time, there was a man called uh, Nestorius. Nestorius was a bishop in the Catholic Church. He had certain beliefs. The Catholic Church didn't like his beliefs, so they kicked him out. And he formed his own following. Nestorianism. We don't study these things anymore. Within no time at all, he had spread churches all the way down into Arabia. He had churches all through Syria, all through Babylon, Nestorianism. All the way over to China, he had churches established by the year 400. He had bishoprics, whole series of churches ruled by bishops. In India, in China, he had bishoprics. There were firmans. Chinese emperors were Christian, Nestorian Christians. They were given trade privileges that they weren't even given to Chinese. It was creating the devil with the Chinese economy. Nestorian Christians, we never heard of them here. Over there, they dig up artifacts in the 4th, 5th, and 6th century uh, that or Christian. Where did these people come from? They came all the way over from this. Nestorians, Paulicans by another name, Martians by another, another name, all came claiming to worship Jesus Christ without the law. Without the law, you can do anything you want. Then, whatever is right is what your leader says. These were Episcopal type organizations from the top down. Followers of the word are Presbyterian type organizations from the bottom up. It is easy to take over an Episcopal organization just by taking over the top. And then everybody all the way down does what the leader says do. Nestorianism, Episcopacies, or, or bishops, an Episcopacy, who, whatever Nestorius or his successor said, was law. Because God's law was not in effect. Only the law of the church. The same thing works with Paulicanism. Most all Paulican type of uh, uh, organizations like, uh, what do we have here? Uh, in America we've got a, a, a new uh, Episcopalian, uh, Catholics. Methodists? Of course, Methodists. We've got uh, uh, New Testament churches. Uh, all of these are Episcopacy, Episcopacy type things. What other the, if you have no law, what then is right? Anything. Anything. It depends on what the leader says is right. Because I don't care what you got, somebody's going to crack the whip. What other the leader says? 
little Napoleons love the Episcopal system, system, and they will not tolerate <coughs> dissent. They will not tolerate somebody else with another opinion because it is their opinion for their organization. And everybody associated with them, they associate with is theirs, or they won't have anything to do with them sooner or later. And that's the way an Episcopal set is. And I don't care uh, what they believe in, if they say they believe in the word, a person who is an Episcopal type, sooner or later, will get that word saying what he wants that word to say. You've got to work, watch out for these types of people. We each are kings and priests, equally kings and priests. Your opinion is as good as my opinion based on the word. You've got to prove what you say in the scripture before I believe it. I've got to prove what I say before you believe me. We've got the ground rules laid out right now. See? We know where we're going because it's all written out in the operation manual. We got an operational manual. I got a copy. You got a copy. All of us can go to the operational manual and say, this is how the machine is run. See? And anybody who violates the operational manual is our enemy. And that is the way it's boiling down to right now. It is not enough to say that you are a Christian. You must be obedient to the word. Because many people say they're obedient to the word. And many people say they're Christians. But obedience to the word is the thing that separates the men from the boys in this case. The Paulicans, then the Nestorians, who had spread all the way over here, the greatest hundreds of millions of people claim to be Christians. Today we've never heard of them. The Chinese got so mad at them that they killed them all. The Mahalans killed as many as they could. People got so mad at them because all Episcopal type organizations become corrupt in time. They've got no one over them to crack the whip. They say what God wants. All Episcopal organizations in time become corrupt. Back here, at this part of the country, we have groups calling themselves Carthas, the purifiers. Roman Catholicism is all right, but they just need to be straightened out a little bit to be purified. You'll run across this name time and time again. The Carthas, the people who want to purify the religion of the time. The Carthas spread into Bulgaria and where is it now Yugoslavia, you know, where the fight is going on now. They went into that part of the country and there was a local Catholic priest called Bogomil. And he spread his brand of religion, of, uh, uh, of uh, Christianity. And his followers were called Bogomils all throughout what is now Yugoslavia. It didn't stop there. It spread right on over to northern Italy. You had Bogomils in northern Italy who wanted to reform the Catholic Church. It spread into southern France in a big way. Half of France became Bogomils or Paulicans. Some places they were called Paulicans, other places they were called Bogomils. But in essence, they had an Episcopal type of organization. They were going to clean up the Catholic Church and they wanted all the dues and all the tithes to come to them. And they got the local nobility to back them. So now they had a protector, they had a sword there that could look out after them. They took over the southern part of France and the northern part of Italy. By this time, the name had changed again. They were called Albigensians and Waldensons. Albigensians from the name of the town, and Waldensons from a man named Waldo, followers of uh, Waldo. Each one of these groups seems to have a, a product of their own, but it all boils down to one thing, the politics. Christianity without the law. It's a very inoffensive thing. This is where 
the Catholic Church moved in with its inquisition. And this has been one of the biggest money makers for the Catholic Church that there has ever been. Many times the Catholic Church has been accused of allowing a heresy to develop. And once the heresy has developed, they then call the heretics before the courts and find them guilty. And then they confiscate the heretics. They confiscate the traitors. I think you'll find that is the fourth plank in the Communist Manifesto, the confiscation of traitors. They allow the heresy to gather enough steam so a number of very wealthy people join, and then they call them before the courts, then they condemn them, and then they are confiscate them. The Inquisition for many, many years was the, one of the biggest money makers in the Catholic Church. It went right after the Albigenses and the Bogovils, and it went right after the Wallinsons and condemned them, confiscated them, and burned them at the stake. By the hundreds they burned, by the thousands they burned, and finally they wiped them out. And it took almost two or three hundred years to completely wipe them out of southern uh, France and northern Italy. Finally they drove them back into the very top of uh, mountains in northern Italy. And now, I understand they have a group still left up there of 15,000, 15 and 20,000, and now they belong to the Presbyterian Church, of all things. Uh, they are Paulicans, calling themselves <coughs> Albigensians, who, who date back to the persecutions of the Catholic Church. Feudalism in Europe. The feudalism of, of India was brought intact and put in place in Europe. Now remember how the setup goes. First is the priest. Second is the king and the warrior. Third are the uh, shopkeepers and the farmers. And fourth are the workers. Everyone must fall into one of those classes. There can be no exception you will be put in one of those classes. When Charles Martel fought the Arabs in France to keep the Arabs from invading, he took over from a local king. <clears throat> the local king had rule of a town. His count was in charge of the town. Charles Martel removed that count and put his own man in there as count and put his own soldiers in the barracks and assigned, the count assigned his own soldiers to look up to the farmers and so forth and so on. The system was set up and ready to go. The land was ruled by kings, but the kings held from the pope in fief. The, the, the counts held from the king in fief. The warriors who ruled three or four farms, each one held their rights from their count in fief. The people, the farmers who worked the land, held their right to work the land from the warrior, uh, the knight, in fief. The workers held from the farmers, who actually worked their land till the soil, from the farmers in fief. At any one time, you could be thrown off your land and actually starve because there's no place for you to go. You did what you were told to do or you were thrown into outer darkness. Today, you work for a factory in fief. And if you are thrown out of a factory, you lose all your retirement benefits, all your seniority, and chances of getting a job. If you're a black ball, you don't get a job in a place else, at least not in that field. It is the closest thing to, to this feudal system as it's possible. That, that's why they call them wage slaves. In the Christian system, if you have a factory, all the workers would own equally in the factory as owners. They would work it as a joint partnership. The concept is entirely different. In a feudalistic system, you have corporations. Oftentimes, you don't even know who owns them. In France, 
the people oftentimes had no idea who was the actual leader, uh, who was the actual owner. He might be, uh, uh, he might be the local count, or the local count would be holding in fee from somebody else, another duke somewhere else. The local man who worked the soil had no idea who his ultimate ruler was. The feudal system. Charlemagne, the great conqueror, Charlemagne, held his empire in fief from the Pope. He went in and conquered lands from the Germans and the Saxons. He rounded the Saxons up and those who would not uh, uh, pledge allegiance to the Catholic Church, he killed. Some days he killed a thousand, some days he killed two or three thousand, some days he killed as many as four and five thousand a day of the Saxons. He spread the Catholic religion faster than anyone before or since. There's another way of spreading the Catholic religion, and that is with the use of the St. Patrick's system. St. Patrick was commissioned by the Pope to go to Ireland. He went to Ireland and he located the most uh, efficient of the kings. Ireland had many kings. And that day and time, a king was not what it is today. A king was a person more of a judge or a war leader. And really, he wasn't head and shoulders of one above or anyone else. But they called them kings, at least the Catholic Church called them kings. They weren't even called kings in Ireland. But he located one of those kings who wished to be more than a king. And St. Patrick went to him and then said, in essence, and these are my words, he said, King, I'll tell you what, I got a deal for you. If you will protect me, and if you will look after my interest, I will bring a religion in here. And the religion requires that people pay rents and tithes. And I'll split with you. You know, all this land of Ireland belongs to the Catholic Church. It was given to him by Constantine, so it belongs to us anyway. But we're letting you in on something that you don't have now. Right now, you've got no money. And frankly, the people really don't even look up to you very much. But we can be established as a church. And we can send people to heaven, or we can send them to hell. And if people don't pay, if people don't pay up, we can send them to hell. So they'll pay up, and we'll split with you. Now, all you've got to do is nothing, see? And if anybody tries to strong on us, you're there to help us out. That sounded good. I mean, it's the best offer you'd had. So he went along with it. And the very next year, <coughs> St. Patrick brought in three bishops. It had grown that fast. Three bishops to rule three bishoprics, three areas of the Catholic Church. Catholicism, Catholicism spread over Ireland just like that, and not a drop of blood was shed in the conquest of Ireland. Ireland was conquered for the, for the Catholic Church in that manner. The priest and the king worked together. The Catholic Church saw to it that the king had enough wealth to hire enough soldiers to protect him. The biggest thing around was the combination of the Catholic Church plus the king that they had chosen. With that, they ruled Ireland. And Ireland started contributing to the coffers of the Catholic Church. Well, let's go back in history just a little bit. I'm afraid we don't have time to go back in history just a little bit. <laughs> uh, we're just going to have to carry, carry that on uh, a little later on. Uh, I want to wind this thing up. The sign of the castle. The castle was put there as a method of defense against the caste who might rise up and revolt against the system. Whenever you have a feudal system in place, you're going to have this, a standing army at the beck and call of the king. Without a standing army, 
a king doesn't stand very long. And they require a castle for the defense of what they claim is theirs. And what they claim is theirs is in reality ours. The land will be divided and never ever sold. And it's not going to be easy to make them give up their land. But all of this tree covered countryside that you look at now, at one time was open plantations. This was open land. It was farm and it was productive. It produced by people who belonged to tens and to belong to hundreds. People who were supposed to pay taxes and didn't. By people who fought the crown to keep from unjust taxation, or any taxation for that matter. This is historic land we are on. At one time we threw out feudalism. We've got feudalism back. We'll continue this on this afternoon. Thank you.